Neoplatonist wine mom is making a big fuss. So the way it works is you have to request to speak, y'all. Hold on, I gotta turn the air on. It's gonna get hot up in here. It's about to get hot. It's getting hot in here. So put on more clothes. It's getting hot in here. It's getting hot in here. So put on all your clothes. Two or three layers. And sweat some more. What's up, y'all? Welcome. As you know, it's open forum. Where is this crazy woman? The way it works, guys, is you request to speak. When you request to speak, I give you the microphone and you get to come on and you get to say whatever arguments you want within reason, within obviously the terms of service, the toss, the TOS, baby, the T and them tosses. If you don't stay within the Taz, you get tossed out of here. Is everybody having fun today? It's a, it's a hot Monday. Because you put on more clothes. Everybody hit like and share. Uh, I really want the angry wine mom to come in here. I mean, she was dipping into that Franzia since 7 a.m., it looks like. And she's over here. She's about ready to tell us about Hapasha. She's explaining to me that I don't understand the great mysteries of Neoplatonism and Hypatia, and that I'm scared to debate the pagans, even though we have offered open forum all the time over here for pagans. The pagans usually, usually are the ones that freak out. They're like, I'm about ready to fight you in real life. Remember that one guy? No! 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 The Australian pagan! No! The way it works, as you know, you guys know, is uh, you request to speak. I give you the microphone. You make whatever arguments you want. Now, remember, typically we want to stick to arguments. My feelings are not going to be hurt if you want to call and say that I'm the worst person ever. It doesn't bother me. I'm sure many of you think that. But let's just get that established from the outset. I am the worst person on the Internet. I won that award last year. Chase Haggard gave it to me. Worst person on the Internet award. Uh, I've got it hanging up above the toilet. And so we don't have to debate that anymore. So I concede the, the debate about who's worst internet man. I am. I'm the KGB sorcerer. In fact, I have right here in front of me this wonderful gift that I got from my buddy Mark Hackard. And this is the Minox preferred. This is the KGB's preferred Cold War spy camera. Pretty cool. It's an actual... Minox spy camera um, comes with this cool leather spy case. It's the leather Soviet edition. And it's funny because when I put the picture up with Jamie holding this, everybody thought it was a pregnancy test. No, we didn't go to a steakhouse and piss on the pregnancy test and then pull it out of the steakhouse. Uh, I mean, this is, and it says in the description of the picture that it's a Cold War KGB spy camera. So what that tells you is that people don't read your descriptions. <laughs> so if you're putting up pictures on Instagram and you explaining it in the description, you wasting your time because ain't nobody reading no descriptions. And this is the, uh, this is the metal thing that the KGB would use right here. If you see this to whip people. So when they got in trouble and they got arrested, they take the CIA man back and go, wah, pow, they whip him with this little thing. That's not what this is. This is to measure because older cameras, right, they don't have a focus. So if you're this far away from the, if you're doing a document, there's little knobs on this thing that tell you how far to keep the camera away from when you're shooting down to the desk. So interesting. With these old school cameras here, some nerd got on to me and said, that is not a KGB created camera. I didn't say that. I said it was the favorite. It's their favorite camera. Western intelligence used the Minox. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's not the favorite of the KGB. And as you guys know, I'm here as a KGB operative and sorcerer to uh, under Dugan and Vladimir Lenin take down the papacy. So that's what I'm commissioned to do. I get paid in Dugan coin, uh, which is a yet to be revealed crypto It's going to go public here in a little while we'll have an ico launch of dugan coin and then you guys can just pay me in dugan coin directly 
to fund the NKVD takeover of America. See a lot of these, a lot of these trad cats think, oh, you're KGB. Nah, brah. KGB went away 30 years ago. But what didn't go away was the NKVD. And uh, I hope the trad cats clip that right now because I want to serve my Lord Stalin as best I can. Okay, where is this crazy woman? Where is this woman harpy, this, this harpy waking up, yelling, harping on her freaking box wine that she's all doped up on? We got moms out here doped up on box wine. So she's saying, I'm here. You got a request to speak. Do you know, do you, I don't see you in the request to speak. So the way this works, right? So take the Virginia Slim out of your mouth, put the box wine down, take a break from the Franzia, and you hit the request to speak button, and then I give you the microphone. When you guys get the microphone, you're going to be muted. That's how the app works. So you got to unmute yourself. I'm about to have a wacky morning DJ thing that's a monkey or a toilet flush that means unmute because nobody ever remembers to unmute. Nobody knows how these spaces work, even though we've been doing this for like how many years now? At least a few. So what's her name? It's not Hypatia. What's her? What's your name? Lisa Reneazen. Lisa, you got to hit request to speak. I want to give her first dibs because she's so mad. She says I'm scared of her. She said, you're scared to debate. And I was like, okay, here you can have the microphone. And then she said, no, you're scared to debate my big brother. Lisa, request to speak. I hope she's the one that called, you're a tyrannical rainer. And you're arrogant as fuck. And by the way, you're an awful person. And by the way, you need to repent. You need to repent, Holmes. Barely. Regardless, you need to barely repent, dog. You need to repent, S.A. Lisa, where you at? You've been harping all morning. Like a good pagan woman ought to do. Yeah, so uh, Militant Thomas is saying that he wants to come in. But yeah, I don't think Spaces works for uh, any PC or laptop. As far as I understand, it only works on... I'm going to go to somebody else if you don't come on here, Lisa. Where you? You're not in here. I'm in here. You got that franzia cloud in your vision, baby. Maybe you're a wine ant. Maybe you're too boomer to ant. Maybe you're not a wine mom. You're a wine ant. You don't have to, you don't have to work this thing. You got to work it. I'm going to put my thing down, flip it, and reverse it. Got to work it. Let me work it. Can the boomer work the Twitter? I put my Twitter down, flip it, and reverse it. Where you at? <laughs> you was talking so much shit all day long. By the way, so we had about mm, five or six trads talking smack. I'm not talking about Christian Wagner. He did say he would like to do a debate. Uh, all these other track cats and Roman Catholics, about four or five of them. They're mad. They don't want to talk. But guys, if you would hit like and share, we're about to open it up because this woman ain't going to come. I don't guess. She just wanted to talk shit all day. But, uh, sh shocker. Um, if you guys didn't see it, we did a great interview with Pearl and Tim Gordon and, uh, Glenn. Uh, so you can go over here and that interview is linked right here. That was a lot of fun. It's that one right there. Occult feminism, how feminism infiltrated the churches. And actually that conversation turned out to be, we, we, we recorded that several days ago and it turned out to be way more relevant to the recent drama on Twitter with, uh, father Barberg and the Antiochian, uh, ecumenists. So go check out that discussion because everything we talked about there applies to the principles that we've laid down with Rachel and other interviews and in my own lectures on how churches get subverted through think tanks, NGOs, foundation money, uh, university placement, archon money. Somebody was like, he's calling the Greek church Gnostic because the archon archons is a uh, honorary title given to wealthy 
uh, Greek patrons and prominent individuals. It's not talking about Gnostic archons. So it's got no idea what they're talking about. Okay, so this woman uh, called me a coward all day long and then wouldn't show up. Shocker, a woman is behaving like a woman. By the way, the other Roman Catholic dude that was talking shit all day, he did the classic move of... You're all full of shit. You Orthodox are full of shit. You're, you're full of it. You're full of horse poop. And then I called him out and then he plays victim. You're so mean and look how you behave. Dude, you just called everybody full of shit. And you're mad that somebody called you back out. I, I've never seen you do, do a formal debate where you were charitable. Total lie. The majority of the debates we do are formal debates that are terrible. Um, these don't count. These are goofy, fun day, day debates. This is entertainment. Infotainment, maybe. Where are you at? I really want her to come because this was, this was going to be... This was the entertainment right here. We we're about to get some wine wisdom. We'll go, we'll go to somebody else so maybe she can figure it out. Uh, George, uh, Forrest Cooper. Preference is given to people who disagree. Got to unmute, bro. Yep. Dead. Are you a so dis... You break... Hey, what's up? How you doing? Not, not bad. I think I just found your stuff, so this is all new to me. Okay. Are you a disagreer, your... man? Uh, it depends on the subject. Uh, short answer being uh, coming from the American side of sort of the reformed movement. That's where I stand. But I don't know if I, oh. from my travels, can say that it's the same everywhere I go. Even in the United States, what you'd consider like reformed Baptist in the Midwest is like Presbyterian in the Southeast or Southwest. So okay, so, you, so you're saying reformed Calvinist. Closer to, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I, anyone, who, anyone who engages in the subject, like we know that there's, you've got your five points of Calvinism. And it's like, well, the the label only goes so far. So the label of Calvinism because you're a Baptist, you mean? Yeah, like which which part of it? Because I think it's almost like it's got so many subsects now. But it would be, let's talk about just theology. It'd be uh, preference of sovereignty of God over the free will of man recognizing the tension in the two but you said you're coming from a what greek orthodox position well i'm orthodox but i don't attend a greek church so there's a lot of okay. orthodox churches that are not just greek in fact, fair, fair. I mean, the majority of orthodox are not greek but yes i'm i'm i, I attend a russian orthodox church russian orthodox church mm -hmm. so i mean they're they're definitely not common in the areas that i've lived where is the point of difference between an American version of a Russian Orthodox church as opposed to other options? Well, I mean, differences are typically going to be uh, like linguistic or kind of local traditions in terms of culture. Uh, theologically speaking, sometimes there's a difference of emphasis, but we all possess the same uh, Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed and we all believe the same the same eight slash nine ecumenical councils. So um, if you're saying differences between Orthodox churches, the differences usually relate to uh, if there's ever a schism or something like that. Most of the time it's something jurisdictional. Sometimes it's theological. Um, but I mean, the canonical Orthodox church is all of the professing Orthodox churches that are in communion uh, and follow the same canon law and the same uh patriarchal structure so that's the orthodox church that i'm talking about russian just happens to be a jurisdiction within that but in terms of what you're talking about um i mean i'm curious if you want to get into the specifics of disagreements like because I, I had a time where i was a calvinist uh, baptist or a reformed baptist i guess you could say and i, I went to reformed baptist church for maybe maybe a year uh and that's when i moved into uh, covenant theology and Presbyterianism back in about 2000, about the year 90, 1998, 2000, uh, 99. So I was already a Calvinist by 2000. So 98, 99 is when I was getting into James White and reading a lot of Reformed Baptist stuff, the Reformed Baptist Confession and Spurgeon and 
all those guys. Um, so have you ever looked into the history of the formation of the biblical canon? Yeah. Uh, my degrees are in theology and philosophy. Oh, okay. Excellent. Well, you sound like the perfect dude to talk to. I enjoy it. Yeah. So, um, so why should we accept the Protestant canon of scripture? Why should we accept the Protestant canon of scripture? Yeah. Not the Orthodox canon. Where's the difference between the two? Well, I mean, the Protestant church typically follows the Masoretic text, so there's some differences in that minutia, but we also have the Deuterocanonical text. Okay. So is there, would, it, would it be worth saying that there is the core canon and then there's the additional canon? Like, the difference between... What, 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 how does that have any play on something like Sola Scriptura or um authority of the gospels like do you see the addition the what you consider the additional i would consider the additional ones the additional canon to be just as authoritative as the protestant canon is that the argument well i would say if you look at the patristic tradition um they do try to prove doctrines from citing the deuterocanonical text all the time so okay. I would say uh, they're useful for doctrine as well, but in the Orthodox view, they don't have the same emphasis and primacy that the Gospels do. So in the Orthodox Church, for example, in the liturgy itself, there's a preeminence, a preeminence that's given to the Gospels, even over Paul's epistles. But we don't have a false dialectic to say that, oh, because there's a primacy given to the Gospels, that therefore may, means that Paul's epistles are uh, fallacious or uh, erroneous or something like that. Even Paul within his letters says that this I say of my own opinion and not of the Holy Spirit. So even at times in Paul's opinion, he says that not every every jot and tittle is of the same level of importance. And so I don't have a problem saying that the Deuterocanonical texts are less important than something like the Gospels, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to be useful, for example, in proving doctrines like praying for the dead. So that's one issue of the Deuterocanon itself, but... The other issue is, what is the epistemic principle that you have to know which is the right list of books? And how do you have that without the historic church that chose that? The episode, okay, so I'm, I'm just putting this all together. It's been uh, a while since we've had a conversation on this layer, so I'm enjoying it. Right. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but you said your philosophy. No. You said your philosophy student, philosophy major guy. So, what's yeah. the epistemic principle by which Protestants determine the true canon of Scripture without reference to the historical church? Would reference to the historical church be considered a negative or a positive? Well, I would say for you, it's uh, probably going to be a negative because the people that put the canon of scripture together don't believe anything of what you believe. That might be a little bit broad. That, that would have to be a little bit broad because saying that we don't believe any of the same things, you'd have to be more specific on that. Well, let's say, let's say the classical Reformation teaching, for example, that people that deny uh, grace alone, faith alone, sola scriptura, uh, uh, you know, sola fide, uh, those people do not teach the gospel. So that would mean that all the people that put the canon of scripture together did not teach the gospel. What did they teach then? I mean, I, I don't, I don't see the difference because there I mean, is they the, teach, the they teach the, or, they teach, on. they teach Eastern Orthodox theology. I mean, you know, we can go read these people, right? Yeah, yeah, no, very fair. I just don't know if I agree with your premise because the... Well, the premise was a question. How, how could you disagree with the premise? It was a question. Or the premise that you don't believe what they believe. Which premise? So if the early if the early church fathers and the people who wrote, or even, even the, um, what we consider just even the Reformed New Testament or the Protestant New Testament wrote what they wrote all took place before you had Catholic Orthodox reformed and so on and so forth. So well, hold on. So the recording of the text is not the same thing as you knowing which, which books go into the Bible. That's two different things. Mm -hmm. 
So I would agree with you. I would agree with you that the apostles were inspired to write down the autographa, right? <clears throat> but that's a different. That's a different that. issue. That's a different issue from you knowing what the specific apostolic authored texts were, because you don't have a time machine to do that. You have to trust in the testimony of the bishops that handed those texts down for many centuries and that produced the canon of scripture in about the seventh century, I think. <clears throat> How is that any different than an orthodox position? Because we both receive the same texts. Well, we receive it from a historic church. That's my point is that you can't <laughs> divorce the canon of scripture from a historic body that preserved it and made the normative decision as to what books go into that book. Yes, agreed. You cannot divorce the okay. Bible that we have now from people carrying it on through time. Right. So what do you think the people who preserved and transmitted that text in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th centuries believed? Give me a give me give me a touch point where I can start on like about what salvation about was are we talking about like the lapse are we talking yeah did they about... believe in apostolic succession? Ooh. Have you have you read for example the canons of Nicaea? Not for a long 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 time. Oh, and but only, only elements of it. So that's a good point. But you did read the canons of Nicaea. Only sections. Okay, what do you think were in the canons of Nicaea? Wouldn't be able to tell you anymore. This is a problem. Well, I'm not talking about the creed of Nicaea. I'm talking about the canons. Mm -hmm. That's are different. We, are we still talking about like, because um, the Nicaean creed had to do with the divinity and identity of Christ. Well, that's part of what the creed dealt with. But then it also had to do with heresy and some of the other issues that they were dealing with. Yeah, and, it, and the canons, which I have up on the screen, deal with the sacrifice of the Eucharist. They deal with the apostolic succession. They deal with the episcopate. They deal with baptismal regeneration. They deal with the uh, hierarchical clergy. They deal with excommunication. They deal with viaticum or giving the Eucharist to those who are on their deathbed. Uh, I mean, none of this is Reformed Baptist. No, because you, you wouldn't be able to make the argument that's Reformed Baptist because what you call Reformed Baptist didn't come around for quite a few centuries oh, later. Okay, so, so the church, what, was it in a blackout? I thought Matt, Jesus said in Matthew 16 that the gates of Hades would not prevail against the church. Where was the church in these centuries? It was still with the people. What people? These people are Orthodox. Is calling them Orthodox in contemporary language a little disingenuous? Uh, no, if I'm literally showing you all of the things that they believe that we believe. Let me read you Canon 18 of Nicaea. It has come to the knowledge of this great synod that in some districts and cities, deacons administer the Eucharist to the presbyters, whereas no canon or custom permits this. They should not give the body of Christ to them that do offer. Also, it has been made, though, that certain deacons touch the Eucharist before the bishop touches them. Does that sound like a Reformed Baptist church to you? No, not at all. Because it has to do, it has more to do with tradition and ritual than it does to do with theology and belief. So, tradition and ritual and not theology and belief. You don't think that liturgy is part of theology and belief? It is. But okay. I think that, I think we're still dealing with the practices of man versus what is true. Interesting. So where did the church get its worship service in the first and second century? Since you want to talk about ritual. It's worship service. Yeah. I mean, you're saying that rituals don't matter. So wouldn't God have told us a proper way to worship? Uh, don't, don't, uh, I'm sorry on that one. Don't say that. I don't think ritual is important. I'm saying that ritual it's there's. Well, you're saying these are bad ritual. rituals and I'm saying that, where does the church in the first and second century derive its pattern of worship from? What's the proper way to do a church service? And how do we know that? Does the New Testament have a service? No, we know this. Oh, but the apostles established worship 
So is it, have you considered that maybe the worship services themselves are something that are not in the scriptures that are uh, apostolically established? They'd still be, if they're apostolically established, they're still partially established by the dictates of man. You think that the apostles didn't teach authoritatively only what they wrote? Because Paul says, all the things that I taught in Ephesus for three years to Timothy, you pass those things on. Mm-hmm. So you just told me, no, you only pass on, they only, they were only authoritative in the written? To this day, we can, we, it's, it's, I think you're talking about authoritative, and I'm thinking... Well, you're just begging the question because I'm telling you that the apostles established liturgies. And so we worship the same way that they laid down that worship. You know, we can go read how in the first and second centuries, the bishops of that time wrote about the worship of the church, right? Irenaeus, yes. Ignatius... Cyprian. Yep. Okay. And they describe the same type of worship that we do in the Orthodox Church. The real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And so in that argument and so in that argument you're saying that the, the Orthodox Church is the only church that follows that authoritative doctrine. Absolutely. Ah. So that's what and, and what is that what does that have in relation to salvific principles? Or salvation. Well, the Orthodox Church is the one true church, and your church is, as you just admitted, a recent invention. Well, more recent. If you're going to call it an invention, maybe that's a stretch, but I can understand the point. Well, now, wait a minute. Do you have continuity with the church that I'm talking about? Yes. Yes, we do. No, you don't. What Orthodox bishops ordained any Reformed Baptist elder? That wouldn't make. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the same thing. We're, oh, okay. We're, so, so still like the the. Well, you began, thing, this, like you began the, this, but you began you began this discussion by talking about how many different divisions and splits there were in the world of, of Reformed Baptists and Calvinists. Yes, but that that argument can be applied to all of Christianity. No, it can't. <laughs> That's my point, because Jesus said that the body of Christ would be like His body, indivisible. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, as the Nicene Creed says, one holy Catholic apostolic church. One holy Catholic apostolic Yeah, okay, so your argument, so the argument that you're making is that there is only one true church, and that is the Orthodox That's church. part of the arg- argument I'm making, yeah. Okay. How many bodies did Jesus have? As a physical body, the one. Right. And the church is the extension of that incarnation of his physical body. Yes. So there can't be two, three, fifty thousand churches. Do you believe in the noetic effects of sin? I believe there are noetic effects of sin, but I don't believe what you think about the noetic effects of sin, because in your view, even after regeneration, the noetic effects of sin are still in effect, and so it should be precluding you from making any normative or dogmatic statements. That's why the Reformed Confessions all say that no body can bind another person to their interpretation, right? Freedom of worship, freedom of conscience. So then are you are we talking just about a difference in aesthetic because you have No, I mean I literally see. right, I'm not being rude to you. I'm just literally just said that heterodoxy versus orthodoxy inside the church outside the church. So no, it's not a matter of aesthetics. Okay. So then <laughs> is it beyond is it beyond reproach to say that the Orthodox Church views only people within, or you, your position within the Orthodox Church only sees people within your, or within the Orthodox Church to be Christians at all, and everyone else is on some form of heresy? Correct. Where's the line between... No, correct. Uh, where's the line between Christianity and heresy? The Orthodox Church. Well, so a, it's membership to a human body. Jesus' church is a theanthropic institution. It's not a human institution. And that's precisely what your heresy is. In the New Testament, Paul, in many places, says that the church is the body of Christ. And you're saying it's a human institution. So you right there just kind of gave the game away. It does. That's a good call. Give me a second here. That's a good call. The point, the problem, though, is that I don't know where you draw the line of who is inside and who is outside the church. Well, I mean... <laughs> Again, there's either you're either Orthodox or you're not. So, are you in communion with the Orthodox Church, or are you in communion with a recently invented group? What does it take to be considered truly Orthodox? 
Well, I mean, it's not just being a member. Obviously, you also have to live it and believe it and, you know, participate in the sacramental life of the church. So I'm not saying you can just notionally think it. Oh, I think that I'm Orthodox. No, it's actually like joining the, the visible group known as the Orthodox Church. So this and is a which, or, which Orthodox Church is the right one? The one I just explained to you, the public canonical Orthodox Church that exists throughout the entire world. It's the second largest Christian communion, so-called Christian communion in the world. And how many version or how many different Orthodox churches make that same claim? Like it's because this, this is the, the so point that I'm you don't understand. You, I... It's this fundamental yeah. misunderstanding of what Orthodox theology and ecclesiology is. Different jurisdictions doesn't mean different churches, man. You understand that the guy that Paul was talking to in Ephesus, Timothy, that there's still an Orthodox church in Ephesus today that descends yeah. that descends from Timothy. And you're that Orthodox church from father to father to father to father. That's apostolic you... succession, correct? Mm -hmm. That's Timothy's the Paul's letters to Timothy. I laid hands on you, Timothy. You lay hands on men after you. Because the giving of the Holy Spirit is transferred, and he says, don't lay hands on men lightheartedly. Make sure that they're good men who can pass on the entire deposit that I committed to you, which, as he says in Acts, was three years day and night teaching. Not just written, because he didn't, he only, as far as we know, there's only two written letters to Timothy. And yet he tells Timothy to pass on the entire deposit of what he taught for three years straight. So the... I think where the, the issue is going on here, I think where I'm going to, I draw the line on this one is that I don't know if I would want to place, I don't think, I don't think you can place salvation within man's institutions, even though we're you keep calling it a man is man's institution. I'm telling you that Jesus said in John that the Holy spirit would be given to the church. I mean, don't you think Pentecost was significant mm -hmm. that he says the comforter will lead you and guide you into all truth. And you're telling me that, at some point, apparently, the Holy Spirit left the visible historical church, and then it had to be restored by whatever sectarian person you follow. Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. The church is the kingdom. It's a visible society set up by the apostles in history. And so what you want is a church or a group di divorced from that historical institution. It is not a man's institution. It's a divine institution. That's the point. Well, saying that I want it might be a little disingenuous. Let's start there because this. Well, is I'm saying, thing. but if you, if you, I'm I'm, to, when I say you want here, it, I'm, I'm coming into understanding more and more about the Orthodox. Church okay, fair enough, but I, it hasn't been prevalent. Well, what I meant by you area. want it, what I meant by you want it, is not to impugn bad motives, but to say that your defense of the Reformed Baptist position would mean that's what I meant by you want. You want, you want to defend the Reformed Baptist position, and that's what I meant. Okay, so then is calling it Reformed Baptist itself ca causing it to become heretical? It's the lack of uh, connection and communion with the church in history and the heterodox beliefs that make it not a true church, not the name itself. Yeah, we could go with a heterodox beliefs for sure. Mm -hmm. The connection to people... Um, the connection yeah, but you just keep you just keep re line. you just keep re just re you just keep assuming that there is no apostolic succession, and I've given you two points already that the Bible itself was put together by these people, and that's why Paul <laughs> says to Timothy that the church is the pillar and ground of truth. He doesn't say that the written texts are the pillar and ground of truth, and he tells Timothy to pass on this inheritance, this deposit, by the laying on of hands. <laughs> that's a historical continuity and succession. Do you remember the Old Testament? Yeah. There's a laying on of hands and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Moses, Joshua. There is, yep, there's the Father. Yep, I'm familiar. Okay, so the apostles are modeling that same structure for the spiritual Israel and laying on hands not on the basis of biological descent, but to induct men into the Melchizedekian priesthood. Because Jesus' priesthood is a continuing presbyterate, which is the Melchizedekian one, a la Hebrews 7. So then, what is it? So then, what is left for those people who exist in the world? I mean, I know, I know half the answer to this one. But what is it left for those people who exist in the world who have not had connection to or communication with an Orthodox Church? 
or they're they're understand they're the Orthodox churches or people who claim to be Orthodox um, are even <clears throat> stretching between you know like. Hey, by the way, um, I don't mean to, I don't. I, don't I, I think the point the the, the problem is, is like the world is big. How do we deal with that? Because I think there's a solution to be had here. Hold on. You have to request to speak. So I'm not... This woman says I'm muting her. You have to request to speak. I'm not muting you. And also, by the way, people are saying in the chat for Christian Wagner, if you want to come on, they're saying that it does now work on PC. So um, <clears throat> uh, Spaces didn't used to work uh, on... On a computer? Yeah. That's what people are saying, but <clears throat> yeah. So, I mean, the question of, uh, what happens to people who don't know about Christ, we lately, we leave that to God. That's not, we don't know yeah. that. So, uh, you know, God's going to deal with them in the way that God deals with them, but there is re the doctrine of recapitulation, which means that all men do by the virtue of the universal nature that Christ assumed have a connection to Christ. But, um, we're not told about their ultimate destiny, um, but we know that sure. it's our it's our duty to tell people to uh, repent and come to the church. You can't you can't divorce you can't divorce Christology from ecclesiology. Is my point. That's why the church can't be a purely human institution. Oh no, I agree. <clears throat> I agree there. It can't be a purely human institution. The different the then the argument being how much of the Orthodox Church is human and how much of it is of God. But fair. I mean, it's a good argument. I, I do appreciate it, to be clear. When I, where, where my experiences within theology are much more focused on orthodoxy as opposed to, like, bloodlines or patriarchal follows, but then you're also looking at, like, I'm sure you're, you know, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you came from some of the more reformed area and you went into um, an orthodox. I think I would like to hear how that happened and why you chose it. Well, I mean, I've got vi I've got videos on <clears throat> I've got videos on that, so you could go, um, you know, watch those longer videos where I kind of break that down. So I won't I won't restate that whole story, but uh, you know, I had I had a long time where I spent in both Calvinism and the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and so to make a long story short, uh, the Church Fathers, the formation of the canon, reading all the Eastern uh, Church Fathers, and and seeing which lined up with Scripture ultimately was the kind of final decider for me on that topic. So then, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. It's, it's, a, it's a useful thing to discuss, especially as far as, um, as we as Christians grow out of that fourth grade version of faith into something a little bit more solid and meaningful, we have to look at history as a whole. Uh, well, yeah, let's, we're going to give somebody else, uh, I'm not going to be rude to you or anything. I'm not being mean, no, but, no, uh, I appreciate it, man. I, yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed this one. So yeah. Well, hop, hop back on. You're welcome to uh, chat anytime or bring any other issues or questions. Now this woman yeah. says, this woman says, I have uh, requested to speak and you have me muted. No, you haven't. Everybody can see how many people are requesting to speak. Okay, is the wine mom on the list? Lisa. No, she's not. So she has not requested to speak. She's saying, oh, you're not going to let me speak. You didn't request to speak. I've asked you 10 times to request to speak. So you're not there. She's like, look, I request. I request to speak. I request. No, you didn't. <laughs> There's the list of people requesting to speak. I really would like you to come on. I mean, you made such a fracas today. And you're obviously not on the list to request. Do you not? Maybe you just don't know how to work this. You just hit request to speak. And by the way, Wagner, you can come on too. So again, today we're giving preference to people who disagree. Constantine. Just hit unmute. Uh, can you hear me, Jay? Yes, sir. How are you? Uh, how are you? Uh, I'm uh, from Missouri, so 
You're what? I have one question. I can't hear you. Speak up. Be quick about it because I watched your uh, uh, YouTube channel sometimes when I get the chance. And okay. I've always wanted to ask you this question, um, which is what is the actual difference between Oriental Orthodox Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church? I, I mean, I've, I've tried to research about it, but I clearly cannot understand what the actual, you know, problem is between the two churches because i'm an oriental orthodox church follower so yeah. i'm trying to so again i would say go go watch the videos that david and i've done we've probably done five different streams on that so david uh Erhan is really good on this topic that's his specialty so if you want to get into nitty-gritty i would say go watch all the videos that david and i have done together um but really it's just a uh, a matter of the place of Chalcedon, whether or not we uh, are wedded to the terminology of the younger Cyril, Miaphusis, whether or not uh, the, the uh, fifth council was good enough to reconcile the two positions, and then the place of certain people uh, that your church considers saints like Severus, which we would not consider a saint. So those are the main issues of departure, but I would recommend to go watch the videos that we did with uh, me and David talking. So let's see here. Thank you for that, though. So this woman is still not here. She's made such a huge fuss all day. And uh, tell you then what? Request to speak. She literally is so... She just can't, she can't even fi figure out the buttons, dude. She's like, tell me what to do. Request to speak. It even works on PC now, so people don't have the PC excuse. Well, I'm not on my, uh, 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 I'm not on, uh, 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 I don't have my phone. Uh, okay. So I think we have another disagreeer man. Nick, what's up? You gotta unmute, bro. Hello. Is this uh, is this our libertarian buddy that uh, we had an argument with before? Uh, yeah. I would just like to say I would like to make the argument that the Orthodox Church sucks and Rosicrucianism, Rosicrucianism, the Rosy Cross is where it's at, and they, they uh, Orthodox got it wrong and they're lame. And in a monarchic theocracy, I would create a new title of King Pope, and I would declare that all Orthodox Christians are heretics. And I would have them burned at the stake. And then I would create devices like a spiked coffin and enclose most of the Orthodox Christians and Baptists in them. And this would be part of the new forms of a yeah. program. But first, that's really funny. Because the angels are forgiving and I have declared it. So I will first let the Orthodox Christians repent before I burn do, them. Do you have an argument? Are you just, do you just, are I'll, you just trolling? I, hold on. And then I'll start the order of the cruciform sword. I like that because that we're getting into we're getting into all right I'm gonna boot you dude will be the only way that the why would you like yeah why would you even want to interact with me being this this ridiculous I do like the idea of the order the cruciform sword though because that's from Indiana Jones right yeah and actually that's real Rosicrucianism and, and actually I was just joking and uh, Rosicrucianism I think is what the uh, cross of the Rose uh, the cruciform sword it actually is you said it was a uh, sufism well i mean but they're I they're agree. wearing muslim hats they're wearing fezes so yeah but it's more like rosicrucianism because of the cruciform the 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 rosy cross well but Maybe i mean have, okay yeah, but i mean that could be but i mean sufis you know they will they're kind of uh uh syncretist so they'll try to have you know secret meanings for all these things too so i don't know what spielberg had in his mind so whatever also, in the new Indiana Jones, there's a crescent. If you noticed, in the, when the um, there's that artifact, it's like a it's like a uh, dial mm. that they go to in the tomb. That's like a, a crescent, mm -hmm. and that and that that's kind of like part of like this uh, Satan worship cult thing that's going on, mm. where you have the crescent, the the black sun crescent thing. It's it's in it's in uh, Egyptian. Um, mm. mythology too yeah. the, the crescent whatever the hell that is supposed to represent now, did you know. have a, a presentation an argument or a, a critique you'd like to make yeah I just 
I just think uh, religious fanatics uh, that think everybody's a heretic is uh, not politically viable for uh, a humanist from a humanist perspective. Okay. Why should we? Uh, why should we believe the humanist perspective? Well, a humanist perspective is is basically that. Um, uh, no, I, I didn't ask for a definition. It's, it's I, not. It's not. I didn't. Um, I, I didn't ask for a definition. I said, why should we believe it? It's not compassionate towards humanity. It's not good for humanity. Okay, so we should be compassionate. Why? On your on your system, just give me the reasons why that's what we should do. Maybe it's true. I don't know, but tell me why. Uh, because uh, the religious doctrines all over the world, and a, and a, eventually theocracies go against so wh- their own theology. Why should I accept the religious doctrines of the world that teach tolerance and not the ones that teach uh, jihad and death? Well, why should you accept your own religious? Uh, so that's theism? a t- that's a two, that's even... a two quote way. So what's the argument from your position as to why I'm supposed to accept what you're saying? The argument is. So do you remember the last that, time you called in? It was the exact same conversation, and you haven't made any progress since then. Do you not understand the question I'm asking? I'm not being mean to you. It's an honest question. I make the argument that theocracy eventually goes its own theism. It okay. goes against its own religion. But that's not telling me why I need. That's not telling me why I should choose your perennialist tolerance religion. Because it's. Do you know what the? Humanity. Let me ask you this: Do you know what a two quote way fallacy is? Perspective. Do you, I want to know why the humanist perspective is true? Maybe it is. This is what I asked you last time. You've gotten even worse than last time. <laughs> it is true because less people die, and dying is bad. Oh, says who? On what is scale? That enough What's for the you? basis for this? <laughs> Do you know what a two quote way fallacy is? Okay, well, yeah, okay, I mean, if, well, if it's I funny, make the argument that dying if it's is funny, bad. yeah, I mean, if it's funny, then we can just move on. So, uh, wine mom, where you at? I thought you were coming. Request to speak. She says, "Look." This is the woman calling me an idiot and a coward all day. Here's the exchange. Request to speak. Hit the button. What point? You have to join the chat, Goofus. Like, Boomer needs it spelled out, right? Like, literally step by step. Join that. Request to speak. Put down the box wine. Let's see if she can figure it out. So we're giving preference to people that disagree. I know a lot of you guys always want to come in, call in and ask theological Q and a, um, I'm not mad or anything, but yeah. Let's have people that disagree with the takes that I have. People that haven't called in. Bruce. Bruce Wayan. What's up, Bruce Wayan? Bro, I'm you, dog. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah, what's up, Jay? How you doing? Good. What are you chewing on? Smacking oh, on some... It's just gum, my bad. It's Okay. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, how do the Orthodox have assurance about salvation? Well, we can have assurance that we are experiencing the grace of God, but salvation is not just a past event. It's a past event and an ongoing event and a future event at the in the eschaton. Okay. So there's no there's no there's no assurance that um, you will persevere until the eschaton unless you in fact do persevere. Okay, and. Um... In orthodoxy, the sacraments are necessary for salvation, correct? Uh, normatively, yes. Um, if, so, if a child uh, dies, I, if a okay, child, like the, the innocents, uh, you know, that are murdered by Herod, if a child dies in some cases like that, the martyrs, the baptism of desire and all that. But normatively, yes, the, the sacraments are absolutely necessary. Yeah, sure. Um, let's say, for example, you have this. I understand why the Eucharist might be necessary, why confession and why baptism is like you know, necessary under normative circumstances. But how come marriage and uh, the other sacraments? Because it's a sacramental lifestyle that we live based on the estate 
that we enter into. Not everybody enters into the marital state. So it's not like uh, you got to stack up all the hit points and unlock all the achievements by getting all of the sacraments. So it's, it's not a role playing game. Um, it's just living out and participating in the sacraments that are appropriate to your station in life. Got it. And you know, Jesus, the son, is is he's a god. He's God in in orthodoxy. So he, he's like God being. But when he becomes a human, isn't he? sort of two beings at the same time when he takes on let's say you know human nature doesn't he like isn't he like a god no he's a single be- he's a single being with two natures so this for us is the teaching of the hypostatic union it means that the two unions were united in the divine person of the logos that assumed the human nature so we when the church rejected nestorianism after uh, uh, St. Cyril and Ephesus and the disputes there, that was a rejection of the notion of any dual subject in Christ. Christ is a single subject, a single divine subject, and the natures are dual. So how can the natures, let's say, unite? How, I mean, how is that possible? And what is the, uh, how is it like? Because it's a divine possible? person with a divine nature coming into time and space and taking on a human nature. How is it possible? God, uh, what is impossible for God, as both the Old Testament and the New Testament say? Mm-hmm. Oh, so uh, just a question about, like, you know, what is the philosophical necessity of, let's say, God being triune rather than a Unitarian? Uh, I think there's a good argument to be made for why um, Unitarian and dyadic positions are uh, metaphysically destructive, theologically destructive, and impossible. So. I think there is an argument to be made for that. And it gets into stuff like the arguments against modal collapse, uh, the arguments against absolute divine simplicity, the idea that um, there's an exchange of attributes between the persons and love and energies, et cetera, that, that occur between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit that don't require a created order. And if you look at somebody like Originism, or like Origin, Originism is a great example because Origin thought that for God to be uh, eternal and to be Father, and to be Lord and to be creator required that he be eternally God, Lord, and creator. So that means that he had to have a creation that he was lorded over. And so uh, you, you get this Neoplatonic and sort of, uh, you know, heterodox idea and origin as an example. Um, you could look at Aristotle as well. If you look at Aristotle's philosophy, he has a dyad because he defines God as a, an eternal actualizer. And if God's an eternal actualizer, then there must be something other than him that he actualized. And so that would mean that an eternal actualizer is eternally moving or causing or actualizing a prima materia, another world or whatever, which is not him. So that would be, as Basil says in Hexameron, a dyad because you've given an eternal attribute to the created order. So now you have have a a dual principle God. So Unitarianism and dyadism, uh, I would say, uh, cancel one another out and are impossible. All right, got you. So uh, just another question about salvation. So, you know, in Romans 8, you know, uh, Paul says, for the, for uh, those he predestined, he also called, he also justified, and then he also glorified. Doesn't that just um, mean that, you, like, once you're justified, you can't, you're going to be glorified and you can't lose your salvation? Uh, no, because there's also many passages that talk about um, the possibility of tasting the heavenly gift, being cleansed uh, in the labor of regeneration, and falling away, a la Hebrews. So um, I think there's a you can speak of a corporate predestination, which is the way Paul speaks in Ephesians. He calls the visible church of, uh, at Ephesus the predestined in Christ. So he's not writing to the elect. Um, but there's also a sense in which, yeah, sure, God knows who will persevere till the end. And so in an, on an individual basis, God does know who uh, the final elect are. But that doesn't mean that he caused them alone to be the elect, because we believe that God can create a world where there's secondary causes. And usually Calvinism is kind of hinging on this idea that there can't be secondary causes and God must be the immediate direct cause of every event. Mm hmm. Yeah, so um, another question about um, Orthodox tradition. The Orthodox tradition is infallible, right? Well, I think there's aspects of the tradition, if you're talking about what relates to divine revelation, that are infallible, but not every, quote, tradition is divine revelation or, quote, infallible. So what aspect would you say is infallible? Like, I know ecumenical councils, but other... Yeah, I mean, any, anything councils, that would which... pertain to divine revelation, right? So... I mean, there are can- there are canons in, in the councils, for example, that 
uh, relate to cities that no longer exist. Okay, so are we still bound to that canon? How? I mean, it doesn't exist. So um, there is a uh, temporal aspect to some of the canons in the councils that I don't think equates to the eternality of the truths of divine revelation. So I think that's a higher category. Okay, so Paul, in, in you know multiple passages, he talks about like you know keeping the tradition, and Orthodox often use that you know passage to talk about how you know, it's important to keep in you know, a tradition, etc. But you know, how do you know what the oral tradition is, and like you know which traditions he's talking about when he says that you should keep the traditions, whether it's in Thessalonians, whether it's in Corinthians, because yeah, um, you, you know, know it, you, you, you know it, yeah. It's it's not like a Roman Catholic mindset where there's a document somewhere that has all of them listed, or there's some secret uh, Gnostic tradition where you get it whispered into your ear when you convert. It's known in the experience in the life of the church, and that's why there is no perfect list of this, and neither Roman Catholics nor Protestants have the perfect written list of all the things that I have to believe. The attitude, the mindset is totally different in orthodoxy because you're going to experience a lot of things that tell you about divine revelation and show you God. The lives of the saints, the liturgy, right? So it's not possible to have a fixed written list of the things that you have to believe. Okay, but like, how do you determine which one you're, which, which well, one I'll give you an you example. So, I mean, when, I think when Paul's talking there, he's talking about the whole deposit, the apostolic faith in toto that he passed on to Timothy and what he passed on to the Thessalonians. Right. So what that means is that something like liturgy is something to be passed on. For exa example, in when, he, when Paul talks to Timothy and he's talking about the traditions to pass on excuse me, the, the succession to pass on me. He says, I laid hands on you, you lay hands on men after you. Uh, the laying on of hands there is connected with the passing on of the whole body of the faith. So that would include apostolic succession as part of that deposit to be passed on. Also, liturgy is a great example of this because the, the apostles, for whatever reason, in divine providence, they didn't write down how the liturgy was to be conducted as far as we know. Maybe Paul wrote something down about that. But, but it, so in other words, the church's liturgical worship itself is an attestation to this tradition that is passed down that is not specific in scripture, you see. So liturgy is a great example. So you can go read the ancient liturgies and you can see as I pulled up there with Nicaea, I mean, Nicaea is listing uh, canons that clearly show the universal church in 325 operates like the Orthodox church. Uh-huh. Yeah, you talked about liturgy, and I think you, earlier you said you had, like, you still have the ancient liturgies of, uh, I think, St. James, correct? You can read the Liturgy of St. Mark, Liturgy of St. James, Liturgy of St. Uh, Basil. I mean, Basil's a little later, but it's still ancient. Okay. So the ones that are written by, the, you know, St. Mark and St. James, how come the Orthodox Church doesn't use those? And It does uh, sometimes. It does sometimes use those. Are. It does sometimes. It does? Yeah. Some, um, hold on. Sometimes it uses them when it's appropriate. But as church history progresses, because of the preeminence of the Byzantine Empire, most of the Eastern Church opted towards tending to do the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. So sometimes it's the liturgy, most of the time it's Chrysostom, sometimes it's St. Basil. Um, but Orthodox churches that are other patriarchates will still do those. That's why if you can go to Western Rite Orthodox churches that do the, the ancient Western Rite. Oh, okay. Uh, so another question about um, you know, well, I'm gonna have to, I'm not trying to be rude, but uh, we're gonna move on because like we've already done a bunch of questions, but I appreciate that. So we're taking uh, uh, giving permanence to people who disagree. So this woman is still not here, no answers. So you can see, talk smack all day. How dumb! How much of a coward! I'm such a retard, and then they won't come. Same with all the other Roman Catholics that all day long smack, smack, smack. Hey, come chat. Come make your argument. Come. It should be so easy, right, to dunk on the ortho bros. Just come dunk on us, dog. And then they don't show up. I mean, who else is, like, saying you can have the floor to talk as long as you want, make whatever arguments, but nobody else is saying that. Da Dawood ha Hajel. Haji. Dawood. Dawood. David. Uh, yo. What's hey. up? Can you hear me? Mm-hmm. Um... Okay, I had a question. No, do causing... you disagree? Hello? Yeah, do you disagree? Oh, no. Um, are you, should I... You go ahead. I mean, I, I want to give preference to people I... that disagree, but go ahead. Okay, so um, 
I had a question because I was looking into different realist positions and um, I was reading Aristotle and I was wondering um, what your critiques of Aristotle's view of objective essences, universals, holomorphism, and like that kind of stuff. Like, what do you think your critique with that of that would be? Yeah, so you can read the Dr. Philip Sherrard paper uh, on immortality of man and the soul. I forget the name of it, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's a good critique of that. I'm not trying to be rude, but we're not. To, that's not the topics today. So the topics today are atheism, Protestantism, Islam, pagans, cults, world religions. Uh, I thought our wine mom was going to call in, but she is. I thought I was promised entertainment, you see, and now I'm let down. Jordan, what's up? By the way, you guys can support the stream via Super Chats. Through Streamlabs, use the Streamlabs function to ask your questions. Send in your super chats right there. By the way, uh, was anybody mean to the Baptist guy? Nope. Remember when Dale had his meltdown this last week? Uh, if you guys didn't see the Baptist, uh, not, not Baptist. That was an interesting interview. Uh, I thought it was a just a discussion. I didn't realize that when we went there and showed up, I don't care uh, that it was going to be a quasi debate. So I want to recommend that everybody go watch this uh, pretty lengthy debate that we have with Dale here, the Protestant, if you want. Uh, it was me and Dr. Branson and the new 2020. Uh, some Protestant guys and everybody's really cool. We had a good time. And then uh, for whatever reason throughout this discussion, and the, the only reason I'm bringing this up is that Nobody was rude or mean to Dale. Nobody did anything mean. And then what happened was after that extensive discussion, he did a hour plus meltdown stream that everybody who's Orthodox is mean and awful and satanic. And this is the pattern that I see, right? Which is that people make this big stir, this big fuss. You can interact with them in a completely charitable civil way. Nobody was mean to Dale. Nobody said anything rude to him at all. And what did he do? Oh, I was persecuted as a victim. They're so mean to me. They're so rude. Oh. He cried about it. Okay. Nobody was mean to you, man. People are going to have to man up. I mean, this is just pitiful to act this way. And everybody can see when people act this way. That it's ridiculous. Just like the Roman Catholic guy today, right? What did he do? You Orthodox are full of trash. Booze horse shit. Oh, okay, come on and debate. You're so mean. No, I can't, I can't deal with you. You're uncharitable. These people do all of the things they say is uncharitable. Virtuous victim signaling dark triad traits. Evigini Migatachi. I can't pronounce your name. What's up? Hello. Um, I was wondering, Jay, just really quickly, because I was trying to study the church fathers, like, um, what do you think is the best responses like by the church fathers to Peronianism slash academic skepticism and also um, like Husserl's bracketing method? Because I've been trying to research, I think, like those methods because they've been appealing to me for a long time. And I was wondering, like, all right, well, um, H Husserl's, bra Husserl's bracketing is still based on the, the notions of uh, epistemic neutrality and that reality is not theory laden. So bracketing doesn't really get anywhere do or do any, it doesn't do the work he wants it to do. And that's why later Husserl like wandered off into like quasi Buddhist views. Um, where do the church fathers deal with Pyrrhonism? Well, I mean, Athanasius has a book called Agentes, which deals with a lot of like classical pagan arguments, but I would think that Pyrrhonic skepticism is kind of easy and it's self-refuting. So. Um, like in its method of like epoch, like, I mean, in the modern time, I think it's, it's been, like, dissolved into, like, fallibilism for the most time. Uh -huh. like, pe like, people accept that you can't have know anything absolutely, so, you know, that they'll, you'll, they'll put, like, fallibilism as a charge. Do you sure. think fallibilism is, like, a, a threat to tag, or does it not solve the, the, the self-authenticating um, foundation question still? Yeah, I think it would have the same epistemic uh, problems that we always highlight with versions of evidentialism and foundationalism. Um, I mean, if you're if you're going to be a skeptic, 
you're giving up debate. And so if a, if a person wants to live that way and go that way, number one, they can't live that way. Um, but the point is that from the advantage point of apologetics, if a person accepts that worldview, then they don't have anything against Christianity. So I've, we've done our job, right? Our job is not to uh, put out the official refutation of every possible position. If our job, our job is to show the positions to be absurd. And if they surrender objective logic, debate, certitude, et cetera, all those kinds of basic principles, then, I mean, we've done our job as an apologist. Skept skepticism is not a real viable position. It's, it's really a surrendering. Well, I mean, it's been like one of the most influential movements throughout Western philosophy, so? Descartes, Hume, you know, et cetera, like, um, that people have been treating it as like, like almost a status point. So like, I feel like a lot of atheism is grounded on skepticism. Yeah, so, and know? so every time they make, every time they debate, they're defying that principle and proving it to be false. Skepticism? Yeah. Well, I mean, like, yeah, they might have to like say it's like a method of inquiry. But it's like, um, you're right. It's it not just have... a method of inquiry. It's a, it's a worldview. You're talking about Puronic skepticism. You, right. There's not, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? This is what the epistemic nihilists try to do. They try to have their cake and eat it too. And it, does, it doesn't work that way. Because they're like in, in assuming a worldview implicitly. Absolutely. Every sentence assumes an entire worldview. Yeah. But is there any way for them to get out of that by saying that they are they're like that that might be the case that they are assuming things but they're suspending judgment about how no. exactly it's manifest no you can't assume. no it's that's a that's just bait and switch that's that's lying because you can't utilize things that then you say you don't have to justify oh my sentences all presuppose logic and universals and all these things but i don't have to give a justification for those because i'm a skeptic that's just that's like, just being a sophist like in the, in the outlines Look, of pure if they can do that, I can do that. Oh, okay. Well, I believe in God and I don't have to give an account for it because it just is. So they're basically just saying it just is. I, it's not that just like it is. It's just, it conforms with our appearances. No, that's say, a, that is to say that, no, 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 that is to say that it just is. Well, why is it, why am I supposed to follow with what appears to conform to my appearances or to my experience? Right. So it's begging the question to say that, well, uh, my skeptical propositions require an entire metaphysics, but I'm not going to be committed to those metaphysics. Well, then that's just being sophistical. In like in saying that you're like you're they don't get look, they don't get out of this dilemma because they say I'm a skeptic. This it's it's self-evident in this sense that that doesn't work. Because if they can do that, I can do that. Oh, okay, then uh, God exists. I don't have to give a justification. It just does. Well, I guess, doesn't that depend on the notion that they, they're saying it, it just is? No. I guess. No. Everybody has the same requirements for justification. That's the pur purpose of debate. So as soon as they enter into the utilization of logic, universals, etc., they don't get to just say, but I don't think there are logic and universals because nobody can know. That's just being, again, that's sophistry. Can they at least question like the method in which the transcendentals are? No, because are, the uh, making are, a sentence requires a certain, uh -uh. making a sentence requires a certain kind of world, certain kind of metaphysical structure to reality. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's perfectly evident. I meant more that like the method in which the transcendentals are derived, that we come to them in the first place. Like Husserl, you know, the epoch method is, Going from the ground up versus you know like there, there's them all at once, it's a, right? yeah you're just yeah. you're just grasping for another human uh, system building project. The point is that human system humans can't build this kind of a system. How are you gonna okay. how are you gonna build an epi epistemology from the ground up? Given that just the fact that man's finite. Well, I mean, I feel like there's like a it's not that man is finite, but almost it's like they're semi infinite in the sense that they have absolute. No, wait a minute. But see, now you've launched into a vast metaphysical idea. So, so wait, is it, yeah. skept is it skepticism or these uh, ob obscure metaphysics of Husserl? Like, which, or you like them both? It's, it's, I feel like Husserl's kind of like both. Like, it's, he's not like the ancient skeptics because it's not like he has no metaphysics. 
right? Like, he was a transcendental idealist for most of his life. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, it, th- then he would, number one, he'd be subject to the same problems of Kant. Number two, uh, why did that take him into basically some sort of Buddhist position towards the end of his life? And number three, uh, the whole project of bracketing is built on there not being, uh, th- that, re- that reality is not theory laden. So you're going to have to first, I would say, solve the dilemma of um, saying that reality is not theory laden. Sure. I'll, I'll have to wrestle with those questions. By the way, what was the book? Yeah, but the, the, I mean, these, again, the point though is that these are futile projects, right? It's like, what's the, the point of what, the, what was the reference? Oh, um, something about Alexandria, about against the pagan arguments that you read, that you referenced? Oh, uh, Athanasius's book, uh, Against the Heathen or Ad Gentes. That's great. Uh, thank you, Jay, for your time. I'll yeah, look good, at this. good questions. Yeah, we haven't had those kinds of questions in a while. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I can't believe our wine mom never called in. Christian Logos. Uh-oh, this sounds like... Is this going to be our evangelical guy that always... Like, how many profiles does this guy have? If this is him, right? Just the one, man. I had a question, too, about uh, Telosbound. Kind of what your disagreements were with them. Uh, Well, I don't necessarily have a problem with a person who is newly converted, um, trying to be a public person or something like that, uh, because I was already kind of doing this stuff when I converted... And, of course, he claims that he has uh, permission to be doing what he does. So I'm not coming at him on the basis of that. But the repeated pattern of, um, you know, working with and aligning with people who are very hostile to what we do is one problem. Um, he, he, he's uh, committed to promoting an ecclesiology that I think is wrong. Every time we have a conversation about it, uh, he basically just doubles down. The argumentation that he uses in the papers that he cites uh, are kind of low tier. They're pretty bad. It's, it's like citing the Old Testament about the fact that there was northern Israel and southern Israel, as if that's applicable on a one-to-one basis to the church of the New Testament. No, in the New Testament, we're told that the church cannot be divided. So you can't use these Old Testament examples as if the church is Old Testament Israel or something. I mean, just the whole and the whole project is all about. We have to uh, figure out how Roman Catholics have holy orders. And it's just silly because once you start digging into it, you find out that really this ends up being, uh, number one, ignorant people that are ignorant of the Roman Catholic position because they don't realize that the development of the Roman Catholic position was that matter, form, and intention are what you need for a sacrament. And that leads to atheists and Muslims being able to baptize. So, so they're going to have to be consistent and either go in that direction with this uh, citing of uh, Florovsky, as if we just follow Florovsky because he's Florovsky, right? That's all they ever do is cite Florovsky. And uh, the guy that they all united themselves with uh, w- went total Fordhamite liberal. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just like a repeated pattern of bad behavior. And, uh, you know, and then he says, oh, they don't know how to use transcendental arguments. The dude literally just got into this like, what a year six months ago and he's like oh they don't know how to do transcendental argumentation it's just it's just silly pride and you know we've been super nice to that dude and i've always tried to be kind to him and he just wants to be a a douche so whatever yeah no i get it and he kind of goes for this like communal ontological argument over the transcendental kind of tag form that you use and to me i just see an issue with this and he coins it like the communal ontological argument which, you know, I respect people that going out and doing this, but even me studying philosophy for three, four years now, I'm still struggling and grappling with a lot of this. Yeah, stuff, I mean, he know? shouldn't, so he shouldn't be, me. I'm sure he, maybe he means well, but he shouldn't be doing right. it. It's going to, and, and what happens right. is that this leads to disaster a lot of times. People that, yeah, and, and all the people that he's aligned himself with, like they're essentially basically heterodox and apostate now. So, you know, he wants to go on that conquest. I mean, it's just the, yeah. the problems that happen with a really young person that uh, is a new new convert. So I would say uh, avoid telos bound. Yeah, I got you. And do you have any like specific arguments against his communal ontological argument? I feel like that kind of falls back into natural theology. And yeah, any, stuff, any yeah, type yeah. of argument like that would be um, uh, essentially a natural theology type of argument. So I'm just going to ask the basic critiques that I would have of any um, any position that posits uh self-evidence um axiomatic uh principles uh because they don't achieve 
they don't achieve the status of justification. Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree. And I feel like, you know, in your transcendental argument for TAG, it can entail, you know, the ontological argument. You can still use these arguments. Yes, you can make it. You can make for a higher justification there. Correct. Whereas he's kind of pushing that away and kind of merging the Catholic kind of natural theological. Yeah, the whole project of everything approach. he does. Yes, everything he's doing is to try to make it an ecumenist Roman Catholic and... It's just like we are. We've we've all been through that, man. We already know all of the right. pushes and the try to. We don't need you, a new convert, to save orthodox apologetics and to save orthodoxy and give it Thomism. And uh, oh, we got. I'm not saying he's giving it Thomism. I'm talking about like I've yeah. seen this many, many times. Like people come to the church, especially if they're academics or philosophers, and they almost always think I need to save orthodoxy with this thing. I need to make them Thomas. I, Father Deacon himself says that he used to be this way. And thank God that he changed his mind, right? Yeah, yeah. And the thing that I stumble across all the time is, you know, you think you have this bright new idea or you see some thread line. And after a couple of minutes of study, a couple of months of study, and you fall right back into, oh, this has been in the church fathers for years. I just haven't right. studied enough. You know, a lot of this comes up as you're going. So hopefully on my channel, I've never misframed you or anything like that. If you ever do have any critiques for me or anything, I'm more than open sure. to accept those too. So. Yeah, and I appreciate that uh, approach. And I think that on a one-to-one -one level, Telos Bound was, has always been open to, to discussing these things. Um, but it doesn't get anywhere. And he just keeps, uh, you know... Uh, doubling down so and he is yeah. you know continues to align himself with the people who again don't like what we do and so uh yeah. I, I wouldn't i would avoid that dude i have one more question uh just with pavlov Varensky too do you have any disagreements with pavlov Varensky? I, I talked to bishop maximus before and he's like yeah i'll never read that guy like we don't really follow anything he says and i was kind of looking more into that and i wondered if maybe you knew i, I have i've only about. heard uh I've heard negative and positive things. I know uh, Lasky cites him positively in one place, so he might be insightful. But I've not read uh, Florensky, so I, I can't say. But okay, yeah, the pillar and ground of truth, like it has some pretty good arguments, but I can see where he can maybe be stepping kind of on that borderline mm -hmm. of just kind of getting skeptical with it, or kind of getting a little too far out there, maybe. So I can kind of, I can kind of see points of contention there. But overall, you know, I was just wondering what your opinions were on all that. So I do appreciate that, Jay. Thank you. Yeah, and usually, by the way, uh, people like Telos Bound are people that we help convert, and then they don't listen, and they go do their own. They want to be on their own uh, quest, and they make huge mistakes, and then they have to learn the hard way. So, uh, yeah. FDA, did you want to say something? No, I uh, just um, request in case you guys wanted to ask anything. Okay, yeah. I mean, if you yeah, if you know anything about Pavlov Ferensky too, or what you've heard, I've I, I've been doing this for about four years. I'm 26, so I'm not going to claim I know everything. I'm definitely just trying to find sources that know more than I do, so I can keep progressing. You know. Yeah, I don't know too much. I've read a few things mm -hmm. um, that seemed okay from what I read, but that doesn't mean everything is. So I'm just not qualified to speak on. Okay. No, I get it. Alex Bain, what's up, Alex? Thank you for those questions, uh, Logos. Those are good. I'm glad you weren't the uh, evangelical dude that always calls in. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Yeah, Jay, I just want to know why you're a coward and you never want to debate me. Uh, is this a real question? Yeah. Oh, you, you are the. You are the. Here you are. A good argument. You don't make a good argument. You repeat the same argument for two years now. Every time you come on, well, you don't deal with it, and you kick me off, and you you claim because some sort because of I don't want to because uh, yeah, I'm scared of you. Yeah, well, I've had you on infinite numbers of times because you have some mental obsession. Like, why do you even want to interact with me? If I don't want to interact with you, why do you want to interact with me? Just attention. Well, because I try to get my point across, and every time we do, you yeah, but you, so just just the same, just you just state the same. You just state the same. You just state the same thing over and over and over. Here he is. So are you going to interact with me or are you going to run away again? I, yeah, I'm scared of you. Terrified going to run away. Okay, so go ahead and boot me and show everyone you're Gladly, yeah. Totally coward. I mean, I just, like, the dilute, like, does anybody actually think that that is going to convince? Like, if I was that dude and I'm sitting here thinking, like, how am I going to win people over to my position? How can I get people following me on Twitter and getting some good traction? To think that this mode, this approach is the way to do it, I'm just going to give you a little bit of social media advice, bro. 
like just just strict social media advice like this isn't working to make a new profile and to come with the same low tier droning on nonsense every time it's just you're wasting everybody's time dude like how much this is what your 10th profile and you literally bring the lowest tier argument ever so the uh, this is open forum if you'd like to come on uh eve eva uh, something if genie migachev star russian mexican that sounds scary yes oh, i'm sorry i thought you weren't going to come on just request to speak again yeah so our uh you didn't request to speak so here's our um neoplatonist pagan woman saying i've requested to speak she has never requested to speak she is not in the She's not in the quay. She's never been in the quay. It's amazing. The ortho bro subculture. Now we got Erica Barra talking shit. It's just unreal. Like everybody, what happened with all the Roman, did something happen in the Roman Catholic world today that made everybody just go feral and get mad? <laughs> let's see what, let's see what old Erica Barra is uh, chewing on today. Something sweet. I'm sure to be very clear. I do not sympathize with, the disgust wait to be very clear i truly do sympathize and i've grown even more i've growth even more i don't know if he's talking about his weight or if he's talking about his emotions that the disgust of such people in the ortho bro subculture the ortho bro subculture let's just have our way and agree and be happy let's nuance our way through the failures now wait a minute you're the nuance bro you and your carbohydrate companion over there that d that ditched you y'all were the ones always talking about it's nuance bro yo dog it's nuance bro i'm lost and bro and then you're over there jay jay let's take this piece by piece and in three months i'll finish my argument because i talk in point three speed right i sympathize with the ortho bros but not their evil subculture. I think that's what he's saying. We are trying to fix a two plus two equals three error. So again, Eric, maybe Roman Catholicism is false. I'm sorry that you wrote a giant fat copy paste papal book last year that nobody bought that you thought would make you super apologist, but how come Lofton ditched you? Does that not vindicate all the stuff that we said about Carbohydrate Lofton. Here's uh, Ibarra's whining today. It's a garbled, I don't know what. He's responding to me about saying that all of the Roman Catholics on Twitter today that were talking smack wouldn't come, and none of them did. And so his garbled sort of uh, whatever he's saying and what's he doing? He's whining and saying that I treat everything like an MMA cage match. So again, it's just these people, it never ends with these people. And we all know he's soft because he's physically soft, right? I mean, physiognomy test, bro. You look like Bluto. So guys, if you want to come on debate, hit the request to speak button. I will give you the, I mean, again, all of these, all they've done is bitch and whine. Isn't this amazing? This is always available. Here we are. How many years ago was the Ibarra debate? Five years, six years. Lofton has thrown him under the bus. He's not on there anymore. They had a falling out as everyone who's in, associated with Lofton has a falling out. They get thrown under the bus by him. They get thrown under the bus on the way to the buffet. I take that back. You can't physically throw Ibarra under the bus. You could throw Ibarra onto the bus and it would destroy the bus, but you can't throw Eric under the bus. Candy Ibarra over there has done nothing but whine and bitch for five years straight. 
So people are always like, why are you mean to Rome? I'm not mean to Roman Catholics. Every time we reach out and are civil and kind and nice, as for example with Tim Gordon, we make jokes back and forth. Tim makes jokes. I was joking with Tim about having a lesbian haircut and my lesbian glasses. I don't care. But what happens is that people like Ibarra, you can't joke with these people. They're so fragile. They freak out. They melt down. Remember when Eric Ibarra was crying that he said, quote, somebody memed him. Dude, the internet memes everybody. Somebody memed Ibarra and he said, the internet is making cartoon strips of me. Cartoon strips? I don't even know what a meme is. Like, Dude, aren't you like, how old are you? You're not a boomer. Cartoon strips. <laughs> what is this, Dilbert? Cartoon strips. They're making, he said, they made internet ca cartoon strips of me and I, I'm embarrassed because my sons will see it on the internet. Well, welcome to the internet. I'm sorry that you got your feelings hurt. And this is nothing, it's nothing, been nothing but an excuse for so many years. And look, this is what, five, six years into this now. And they're still using the excuse that I mean. How come Tim Gordon can interact with me absolutely fine? If the whole problem is that I'm mean, and by the way, everybody's seen that, as we said about Lofton, he's thrown all of the friends and people that he had with him under the bus. That's Doesn't that suggest that maybe it wasn't my problem? Maybe I wasn't the problem in the Lofton situation. Maybe Ibarra wasn't the problem in the Lofton situation. But they're still whining. Still whining. Still He's too mean to interact with. How come Muslims and atheists can interact fine over here? How come I'm going to have a debate with uh, Hikikachu? With Pikachu? You don't see Pikachu whining? Eric, I'm going to help you out here. Number one, put down the food. I'm being serious. I'm not being mean to you. I'm being mean to help you out. Get on the carnivore diet because you are unhealthy. Being that large and unhealthy literally will affect your mind. So your effeminate constantly getting upset and whining might have to do in part with your diet. I'm being serious. And if you do that and you figure out that, oh, maybe that actually might help me. Then you'll see that the jokes, all of this, it's not ultimately from a mean spirit. We don't want to be enemies with you or any of these people, but I'm sorry that you can't take jokes. I'm sorry. I mean, I don't care if Tim, Tim Gordon, I made fun of Tim Gordon. He made fun of me. And then we talked and had a good time. You see how that works? That's what guys do, right? A man who has a disagreement with another man can laugh about it, have a fight. You're fine. Maybe you can even go have a, a boxing match. That's a masculine way to settle these. That's what men do. Crying and whining on the internet that somebody was mean to you and hurt your feelings is effeminate. Some others are saying, you need a makeover. No, uh, I'm not a soy man. I don't do makeovers. So you could take that over to the Roman Catholics and tell them to get a makeover. That's not what I do. So if you want to come on and chat, I'm going to give preference to people that disagree. Uh, following Jasmine. What's up, dude? I have no point to make, so I attack the person. Really. Literally been over here for how many years critiquing Roman Catholicism in probably hundreds of hours of video? Hundreds of hours of video, and you think that I don't have an argument. I only... Uh, that's called making jokes, dummy. That's called rhetoric. It's part of debate. Go watch the eight-hour response to Trent Horn. You don't got nothing but being mean. Dude, how are you going to survive in the troubles and strife that will come in the real world in your life? You're over here crying about mean on the internet. Unbelievable. What's up, dude? Hey, Jay. Uh, so, um, I've grown up Protestant, and that's pretty much how I've raised my children. Um, currently attending a Baptist church and just, you know, out of ignorance, we honestly just did not really understand the Orthodox church growing up. 
never really heard much about it. You know, I've heard of different denominations, Catholics, obviously, but so we're really new to orthodoxy, and we've uh, attended a couple of liturgies. We've attended uh, a few vespers, and uh, just trying to understand better and, um, you know, search out the truth. And one of the questions that uh, both of my kids have, I call them kids, but they're both in college, uh, different colleges, is in regards to Second Thessalonians, when it talks about, um, like, keeping away from uh, brothers who aren't following the tradition. Mm-hmm. So one of the issues that they have is they're both very active in uh, helping out the poor, in spreading the gospel, obviously the way we've grown up teaching it, not not the orthodox way. And they've both made attempts to seek out orthodox churches. One of them doesn't have an orthodox church really anywhere near their school. The other one does have an orthodox church, but the the complaint I get is they don't really seem to be very active in helping. They don't seem very active in uh, spreading their beliefs. But so it's like, well, if I inquire about orthodoxy and I want to be a part of that, then would it be wrong for me to continue helping the poor or preaching the gospel with our previous understanding? Uh, so it's like, well, just find a good I church. That's, that's I mean, if that church struggle, sucks... The... Like, well, how do I continue to serve God? I want to do things the right way. Well, I yeah, so I would say... Right I would say find a good Orthodox church, and that might take a while, um, but I would not say that you need to keep preaching Protestantism. Nemanja. Nemanja. By the way, to the guys talking smack, Reba, Chris Ostom... Why don't you just come into the Twitter space and debate, dude? Instead of trying to argue with me over $1 Super Chats. Just come debate, man. That's what the whole purpose of this is that you can come in the Twitter space. And they're saying that you can come in Twitter spaces now from laptop or PC, which you should used to not be able to do. Which, by the way, means that that woman was completely lying when she was like, I, I tried to talk and you wouldn't let me talk. You didn't try to talk. You never popped up in the request to speak. Just completely ridiculous. She probably was actually being straight up wine mom, right? I think a lot of people are just drunk on Twitter, just talk, just saying nonsense, right? We're straight up uh, Twitter. A lot of Twitter is is the uh, the Franzia verse, right? We're over here with some some Zinfandel. We're over here with some um, Moscato, right? Go ahead, dude. Oh, my bad. I thought you were on here. Uh, go ahead, Namanj and whatever. You had your box wine this morning? Did you get a Virginia Slam? Did you put a Virginia Slam in your mouth? Did you get divorced today? I'm going to get divorced. I'm going to get a bag of... Bag of Virginia slams and a box wine. And I'm gonna go celebrate after a couple of Xanax. Cause I own this mofo on Twitter. That's what she's doing right now. I own this mofo on Twitter. I'm over here at the diner cause I'm a diner waitress. You want some more tater tots? Y'all need to come look at this mofo I just owned on Twitter. He didn't even reply. That's what we're dealing with. This is the people that want to debate over here now. I mean, it's just total clown land. We've entered into the clown verse. <clears throat> Bro, I'm adding you as a speaker. Put your box wine down. Put your box wine down. <laughs> ump, ump, 494, talking smack in the Twitter. Come to the debate. I think the internet, the internet just produces like a giant world of cowards that just like sit there saying nonsense and won't ever actually have their ideas challenged. Well, I'm sorry, Namanja, whatever, like you can't connect. Every time you try to connect, you're not there. A wolf. 
Oh! The Wolf's Drink box wine. Box beer. Nice. That's what I'm talking about. Box beer, baby. Yeah, um, it's great to talk to you. I just wanted to debate a little bit about Protestantism, about some stuff I like about it. The simplicity of the gospel is really unique, where, you know, you believe in your heart, you confess with your tongue, and it seems like that that carries a lot of weight, but yet at the same time, it doesn't seem like it does over time. So what would you say about that? Well, I mean, confessing with your mouth does not mean that that's all you do. I mean, you'll notice that, you know, the rest of the New Testament, for example, you're told to be baptized, you're told to go to church, to pray, right? Do not forsake the assembling, as Paul says. So why would we think that, you know, because it says that. <clears throat> so here's this guy saying, uh, this is what people do. Uh, will you not ever cover revolt against the water, modern world by Evola? I mean, I've read Evola. Why are you a monolingual smooth brain? Yeah, just stop. I'm not going to answer you, dude. If you're not going to come have a question, you're not here to actually debate. You're just trying to troll. So, yeah, I will absolutely refund your super chats and I'll block you as well. So, good job, dude. Um, yeah, so, I mean, that's a good question. But I would just say that, you know, you can't reduce Christianity to these uh, minimalistic one-liners or the Romans Road, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's obviously a lifestyle. Right. That's why in orthodoxy, you go through one to three years of catechumenate. It's not a thing where you, um, you know, just confess one thing verbally. Like, and this is part of the problem of Protestantism. Um, Can I add something? <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> I, I think you're spot on with saying this, a critique of this minimalist approach. Um, I would add, too, it is important to ask ourselves, what does it mean to believe in? and confess um typically a protestant will just have that as the worst but believe in doesn't mean a minimalistic reductive is it oh, i believe jesus is the son of god is that it what does son of god mean and we, we've talked about this too and even my debate with uh matt slick in uh, an analogous way to um, epistemic holism, all these terms refer to other terms. So who is who is Christ? Um, what does it mean to believe in? It's the entire system. You can't just simply pick and choose and then say, well, I believe in. And what you'll notice is if you ask a Protestant, well, what's the minimum that I have to believe in? Of Jesus is the Son of God. Well, what does that mean? That He's God. He's, and then they start adding more and more stuff. Now, you, what you'll find is that these are unjustified and arbitrary uh, assumptions from from their worldview. I mean, who determines how many of these things do you need? Do you need five? Um, the Mormons are out. Um, they believe. Uh, in Christ. No, not in the same way. Um, well, do you have to believe he has two natures? Do you have to believe that? You see, all these things actually matter. So to say believe in is to believe in the entirety of his revelation. I think that's an important point to bring out. And also, um, Scripture itself teaches against perspicuity. Right, St. Paul? Many of these things um, are difficult to understand and uh, those uh, twisted to their own uh, destruction. So it also reveals to an unfounded, uh, unjustified assumption that God wanted to give us, that that's the way God was actually uh, required us to live, is to give us just a simple kind of instruction set. Um, and you just read it, and, and that's all that's required. Whereas, Jay, you were pointing out, it's a life. It's an entire life. You don't get to pick and choose. It's not a system. Um, and it's certainly not, let's strip it down to the bare minimum propositions, and then I just assent to it, and then I'm in. Yeah, good points. All right, let's move on to uh, Nemanja.
I'm sorry, dude. Like you're, you're not connecting. So, hello. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. How you doing? Uh, oh, well, I didn't want to interrupt Father and Ananias. That's fine. If I am to speak, I will. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, Jay, uh, a couple of questions. First, I spoke with uh, some atheist materialist dude, and I brought up. Uh, in in a way, in my in my kind of of understanding, something like tag, and uh, and when I explain it is a coherent uh, it co it is coherentism and that kind of position. He just replied, when anything can anything can be uh, set up in a coherent way. So uh he said a universe could explain itself as uh, god well now first of all no no it's first of all it's not true that anything can be set up in a coherent way second the argument is not just that it's true because there's coherence because you could conceivably create a conceptual system that is internally uh, in, uh consistent and coherent but has no relation to the external world so it's a fundamental misunderstanding that the transcendental argument is not for uh, an abstract, conceptual, consistent system like some sort of big math problem. It's an argument for a worldview. Very different. Yeah, yeah. And Bonjour talks about this too. Um, we, first of all, it's important to realize that our position isn't simply coherentism. Right. But when Bonjour was talking about coherentism, he said there's a misunderstanding. It doesn't mean that the system's consistent. For example, you could have propositions, the tree is green and um, squares have four sides. Uh, they're they're consistent. What was that? Well, people misunderstand what coherentism is in the first place. And what Bonjour and his epistemology book said what it doesn't mean is that things can be consistent for example you could have the proposition the tree is green and a square has four sides that's not what actual coherentism is the idea is that there's actually logical inference there's no logical inference to the truth from the tree is green that therefore uh, squares have four sides so first yeah. things we need to get straight is what is even meant by coherentism is that all the propositions not only are logically consistent, but coherence means that they can be inferred from all the other propositions. Now, yeah, yeah. that eliminates a lot of stuff right there. And as Jay said, even if you get to that, if you can conceivably construct something like that, you still have the problem how does that system serve to be a justification? How does it even map onto the world? There's further problems than just simply, oh, I created a, a coherent system in which every proposition of the system can be derived um, or inferred from all the other propositions. So if I got you correctly, it needs to have explanatory power also to, to the world or what? What do you mean? Yeah, just look, read the yes. Russ Mannion paper. So I'm not trying to be rude, but we're going to have to uh, rush through some of these uh, because we got a meeting I have to go to here in a little bit. Um, so, but we have another uh, caller here, Daniel. I'll go to Daniel. BMX, $19,665. Can you leave up your intros longer? Um, I mean, they're pretty long, and then every, all the boomers and people complain, why are your intros so long? Because they don't know what a live stream is. Uh, Theosis Pilgrim, $10. Cope and Seethe, uh, AFN Boomers. You can't, I think you mean Ancient Faith Radio. You guys can have Pachamama, Francis, and we will keep Jay. Shout out to Diet Soda Light. Timotheus, $3. I know evil has no ontological reality as a privation, but how do we think of the devil? The devil's nature is good. So, I mean, this is, you know, standard Orthodox theology. You can read the Cabadocians. The, na the nature of the devil is good, even still but he misuses his nature and continually sort of is confirmed in the perpetual willing of evil. Um, sounds like he is the embodiment of evil. No, he is the, and the angelic nature is even still good. Does he have, is free will the source of evil? Um, you could say it's, yeah, it's, it's the source, but it doesn't make evil real in the sense of having ontological existence. Did God know what Satan would choose? Yes, God is omniscient. Rigovich, $5. I love all the content 
Am I blocked because everybody's ignoring me in the chat? Um, I don't know. So I don't usually moderate my chat because I don't have time on YouTube. So I don't know if somebody booted you or, or muted you for some reason. Thank you for your content, Chris. I'm hope to be half as knowledgeable on these topics and how the world is run one day. God bless you and your family, Chris from Ireland. Thank you so much, Chris. Really cool comment there. Samuel 2616. Jay, I'm interested in orthodoxy. Thanks in part to your work. I'm going to be attending a couple Orthodox churches in the next week, so thank you for what you do. Hey, thank you, Samuel. Hopefully you find a good, solid parish. Canonic, $5. I get that ADS thinks that distinctions e equate to division, but what is their reasoning? Um, twofold. Most of the time they take it as a self-evident principle from natural philosophy or from uh, just citing Aristotle or the, the Hellenic philosophers. Um, then they'll say that it has to be this way for some scholastic rational reason. And then they'll cite just Roman Catholic dogma and, uh, Aquinas or Peter Lombard's identity thesis. Um, is it because potentiality and movement would imply a uh, final cause and therefore incompletion? Yeah. They think that if you introduce any potentiality at all, that it means that God's changeable has parts and is a creature. But if you look at, um, Bradshaw's work, uh, and the other, theses that PhD theses we've covered, uh, like the Cappadocians on simplicity thesis. Uh, I mean, it points out that originally when the debate was happening with the Cappadocians, divine simplicity was not being argued in, from the vantage point of reducing the attributes to the essence. It was primarily and first and foremost, a question of is God acted on or a does he act upon? And so ultimately God is simple, meaning that his essence is not acted upon. It's not changed or affected by creatures. But even still, there is a reality of God having a reciprocal relationship with men. And Bradshaw has a great paper on that, showing that the Thomistic doctrine of God would basically make prayer pointless because God doesn't have a direct relation. There's no recipro reciprocity between when you pray, God acting according to your prayers, right? ADS precludes that, as well as things like the incarnation. Stephen Harding, $10. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Stephen. So did the guy that sent... Uh, Two super chats, Rabe Chrysostom being a douchebag, calling me a monolingual smooth brain. How are you at, uh, grasping Aristotle without knowing Greek? So first of all, I don't think that um, it's absolutely necessary to understand the philosophers to know uh, every philosopher's native language. It would be a great skill. I do think that linguistics are a great tool and skill to have, but it's kind of like the biblical uh, texts. How many biblical scholars know biblical Greek and Hebrew and come to uh, tarted conclusions and are idiots? A lot. So linguistics is a great skill, but it doesn't necessarily uh, grant you reading comprehension or uh, depth of understanding and the nuance that you need to be able to do uh, metaphysics. Can you honestly say that you know Aristotle? Um, I don't claim to be an expert on Aristotle. So I don't know where you're getting the idea that I never claimed to be an expert. Uh, I said the other day that I would defer to Tim Gordon uh, or Father Deacon Ananias on Aristotle. So I don't know where, where you get that I think I'm an Aristotle expert. Uh, you think you're more intelligent than Aristotle. Um, do you really think that disagreeing with somebody or critiquing somebody necessitates or means that you think that you're more intelligent than them? I mean, that is almost so dumb of an argument. I don't even want to reply to it. Orthodox dude, one dollar. Is gender a part of hypostasis or nature? Gender would be, uh, I would say, probably both. I mean, I don't think we ever lose our, I will never cease to be a man in the eschaton, and uh, you will never cease to be a man. Christ never ceased to be a man or, or have his biological or human nature changed. So I would say both. Does uh, the gender issues relate to a confusion of nature and person? Um, it might have associations with that. Uh, some of the people who promote it, from Fordham, try to go to Neoplatonic arguments that uh, the fall into male and female was something that put us into a lesser state of reality. And I think Maximus, the confessor, is actually wrong on this point because he does kind of repeat the Neoplatonic position. So uh, it may relate to that at times, but I don't think that the ultimate root of uh, today's transhumanist weirdos are thinking about confusing nature and person. Uh, I don't even think they're, those concepts are not even remotely in their mind. So got, the guy asked me again, uh, do you think you're smarter than Aerosol? Again, this is uh, the fact that, I mean, you would, I could find any person that's a renowned figure that you disagree with. And would that mean that you think you're smarter than them? I mean, it's just such a ridiculous question. Aisha, $10. Thank you so much. BMX, $10. Thank you so much. 
BMX 9266 again for ten dollars. Hello, Father Deacon Ananias. Bite Scribe five. How do you uh, harmonize works with uh, grace in Ephesians? Uh, precisely because both of those things are necessary. Paul, even Paul says, the very guy that wrote Ephesians says that the faith that saves you is the one that works through love. Okay, so he's saying the same thing that James says. So it's a lot of times Protestants that presuppose, oh, Ephesians must mean that there's no willing, no acting, no working at all involved in justification. Well, baptism is justification because it's, genera it's regeneration and that's a work. So um, I'm going to have to go pretty soon. Daniel, what's up? I'm leaving the box one up there because she never came with all of her smack talking. Hey, Jay. Yep. And then, um, what do you think of uh, St. Francis of Assisi? Uh, pre less delusion crazy. Just straight up crazy? Yeah. All right. Um, so. Is that, do you disagree or what? Uh, well, no. So. Okay, well, I'm not trying to be rude, yeah, but today no. this. This was Disagreements Day, so if you don't disagree, then uh, I'm not trying to be rude to you. Uh, Rhett Accardo. Who has worse hair? My hair is gorgeous, dude. It's going full McConaughey. It's going to be all the way down my back. So you can uh, chew on that, Zachary, who hates my hair. My hair is hurt by the way you're a vic you're abusing me and victim i'm a victim i'm a victim he's abusing me he doesn't like my hair please uh can i tattle on him can i tattle him on him to the internet authorities this man is abusing me he made fun of my hair i'm hurt it's time to retire from the internet the toxic abusive bullying going on, on the internet <laughs> bro are you gonna talk or what Rhett. i'm mute I have a t-shirt that says unmute, bro. Unmute, dude. All right. He's not going to answer. So, and you'll notice that the uh, woman never did call in after all of her jibber jabber. So here's what she said when she never came up. Jadar is a controlling Christian. Know it all. Won't even unmike. So she doesn't even know English. Like half of what she says doesn't even make sense. Unmike, unmute. Like she never requested to speak. Again, wine mom. Everybody, uh, thank you for today. If you would subscribe, also remember to go to chalk.com. That is the show sponsor. Boost your testosterone with the Tonkat Elite. <clears throat> That's my favorite. Use the promo code J50 to get 50% off to become a mean person like me. It's so mean. So mean. So I just keep making fun of the people that do this stuff because it's all so ridiculous, right? I mean, they're still, I mean, they'll never stop whining, right? Like we'll be 10 years down the road and the Roman Catholics are going to be like, oh, he's mean. So you see, I, I, I don't have to listen because, it, and like, what's actually mean? Oh, you made a joke about Ibarra five years ago. Okay. Well then I guess if that's mean, I'll just own up to it and be mean. So, I mean, this is ridiculous. They're just cowards, man. They're cowards, and they won't interact with people that will call them on the BS. Just like that guy today who talked crap all day about Orthodox. And by the way, the other guy wouldn't debate either. So they all declined. And when they decline, they typically say he's mean. Pure soy. Pure soy. How come Tim Gordon is going to come do an in-person debate and doesn't have any problem and doesn't think I'm mean. Maybe he does think I'm mean, but he doesn't bother him. Mean? I'm starting to think, I heard a, a whistleblower, a whistleblower from Twitter saying that the internet and um, social media is going to have to be shut down and clamped down, quote unquote, because of bullying and people are mean. I'm not joking. So I'm, I'm starting to think that mean is this new, is a new buzzword that they're going to try to use to actually clamp down again. Cause I'm seeing it everywhere. And it's like mean is subjective. 
I mean, it might, it might in some cases be extreme and uh, not subjective, but I mean, a joke, rhetoric, laughing, doing impression. I mean, is that bullying and mean and abusive? Now you understand all of this is in the public sphere. So a lot of these people think, well, I, I want to say what I want. I don't want any repercussions for what I say. And you'll notice that they'll say things about me all the time. And if I reply, they say I'm bad for replying. Why are you attacking the priests? Why are you attacking people? These people talk about me almost on a daily basis. So I can reply to them. Everybody have a good night.